Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so Keith's point of where we are in the course right now is we've just had this field trip. You guys have just spent some time thinking about what you did on that field trip and writing in, in the first parts of your reports. And, uh, and this is, has to do a lot with, you know, field observation. What do we see out there and how do you put that down into a report? And, of course, how will that then feed into the rest of the course? And that is, you know, what's going on at Lassen Park and how does that relate to the critters that you see living in various places? Of course, the obvious things are the plants and animals and all that, but we're in astrobiology, we're getting more into microbial life and so forth. So that's the big theme, and you know the whole start of this of this thing is really having that field experience, making a bunch of field observations, and getting some samples. Okay, samples of organisms, samples of water. Uh, we've already sort of dealt with samples of rocks and stuff, um, although you, some of you, you know, we did take samples of that as well. All right, so that's the key thing. Another point I just want to make is that in addition to talking about astrobiology in this course, I really wanted to give you guys some exposure to things like topographic maps and information that relates to the land. Uh, all the things that you might need to know about land, uh, whether you're doing astrobiology or doing agriculture or doing whatever, that's just going to be really quite valuable so that you know, we can all become stewards of the land and, and contribute to public decisions about how land use should proceed and so forth. One of the key things that we really wanted to make sure you got some exposure to uh, are topographic maps. And some of you are quite uh, already aware of those and you have used them. If you ever go hiking or someplace out in the country where you want to sort of navigate where you are and maybe make notes about what you've seen, uh, topographic maps are just wonderful things uh, to help you navigate, to help you document things. Um, one of the key elements of maps are these lines, little fine brown lines that you see here which I sort of like to think of as like, uh, L, they're, they're lines of equal elevation. And when you plot them on a map, that helps you identify where hills and valleys are and why lakes are located where they are and why streams are located where they are. So to, they figured out a way to express a three-dimensional you know, three topography on a, on a two-dimensional surface using these lines to, to map out lines of equal elevation. And so, for example, Warner Valley, Here's the swampy area, here's the valley itself, and you see all these lines running parallel to the valley because they're delineating slopes going up this way and going up that way out of the valley. And so it's a very, and after a while when your eyes get trained to this, uh, you find that you can almost envision what the land looks like just by looking at one of these maps. So if nothing else, if we can get you all a little more familiar with topographic maps, you're gonna, I know you, many of you are gonna encounter this in the, again in the future and then you'll be just better able at dealing with that. But I'm going to use this kind of a map to try to illustrate some of the key points that, uh, that we want to get to here. And that is, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, looking at how the volcanic activity, here's Lassen Peak up here, and you can come up closer later and look at this if you want. The lines illustrate that this is a very high peak and that it sort of slopes off to the east, southeast, just as I showed in my talk. And that you're looking out into that area here, which is Warner Valley, which is where we went in our field site. And so lava has flowed down this, and of course the other key thing is that water that, that melts from the snow up here uh, has found its way down the hill in various ways down to the east. And where it encounters other features here, it gives rise to all the interesting features that we see in the valley, uh, in Warner Valley. So one of the things I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about uh, just the landscape where we have basically the high ground to the, to the west coming down the hill into an area where we have Warner Valley. Okay, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Um, and so we have up in the, in the high country, we have the snow accumulation here, basically, that occurs during the winter time. Okay, and then the idea is obviously that as, as we come into spring, that snow melts and forms runoff. Of course, down here we have Lake Almanor, uh, which is obviously quite full of water and therefore you know, it represents an obvious uh, focal point for the flow of water down the hill. Uh, but the other thing that it was made in the that point that was made in the talk is that water can also sink into the ground here. And uh, the other feature, which I'll obviously get involved with, is that we have down below, deep underground, because this is, after all, Lassen Volcanic Park, um, we have sources of heat in the form of very hot rock or, or molten rock. As, as a consequence of the, of the, of the geologic activity of, of Lassen Volcanic Park. Okay, and just for the heck of it, let me mark Warner Valley here. 
Let's say Warner Valley is located right about in here someplace. In fact, it'd be smart. Yeah, that's good. All right, that'll do for now. Okay, so now I'm going to ask some people for some answers here, uh, and that is about the water. Uh, the first thing is, is, as you may have heard from, from talks that were given, is that most of, the, most of the water that enters Lassen Park enters the snowfall in the wintertime. So let's say it was that, when that water arrives on the snowpack, um, what can you say about what's in the water? Uh, how, how, what, what, what kinds of things might you expect to find in the water as it's condensing and falling out of the atmosphere? Hydrogen oxygen. Hydrogen oxygen is water itself. Is there anything else you think much to speak of? No. Okay, so a key point is that when water comes into our store here, it's coming in pretty much as pure water uh, at the outset. And so now, let's say the water, and it's pretty much maybe the case when it's sitting up there in the snowpack, unless there's dust or something blowing in, you might get a little bit of water involved. And so let's say now it's really cold in the early spring. The water then begins to melt and flow down the hill, and it's now coming in contact with rocks. Um, what do you think might happen as it begins to come in contact with the rocks? It erodes the rocks. Who's that? It erodes the rocks. And yeah, it begins, and so therefore maybe some things get into solution, okay? Uh, let's, let's say you're in the, instead of here at Lassen, you're in the tropics someplace, and the same thing happens. Water's running down a hill. Uh, you figure the same kind of thing would happen, right? It would interact with the rocks. Do you think in the tropics that it might, uh, how much reaction do you think with the rocks will happen in the tropics versus here at Lassen, where it's pretty cold? More. What was that? A lot. A lot, yeah. So in the tropics, because of the warmer temperature, uh, there will be more interaction with the rock and therefore maybe more things going into solution. Okay, so now let's now go into the subsurface and as the water flows down into the subsurface, same thing, right? Interacting with the, with the rocks, uh, probably pricking up some things in solution. But now let's say that the water gets to a point where it uh, suddenly hits this hot zone here. And as a result of that, uh, it gets a lot hotter. So here now we have hot water. So what do you think now would happen with respect to water's interaction with the rock? It boils. What's that? It boils. Well, it gets, gets a lot hotter in, in terms of the interaction with the rock. I agree. Anybody else? It gains different gases, like sulfur and stuff. Well, that, that's a good point. And also, your answer about how the water would be in the tropics was that there was going to be a lot more interaction. So it doesn't matter whether you're, you're, you move from this cold place here to go to the tropics or whether you're going from this place here down into where it's hot. If it's hotter, there's going to be a lot more interaction with the rock and a lot more stuff coming into solution. Okay, and then somebody else made a key point, and that is this notion about boiling. Um, it's, well, what, okay, first of all, if the water's going down this way and it suddenly gets hot, what, how do you think the, the direction might change? It goes, it goes up, away from the heat. It's, it starts to get hotter, and what does hot water do? Rises. Well, hot water begins to rise, okay? Now, as hot water rises, um, it, the pressure decreases, right? Because it's rising in the subsurface. So if you take a pot of water and you boil it at, or at sea water temperatures, at sea level, or if you go up in the mountains and boil it, what's the difference in the boiling? It's a lot lower. Up it boils at a lower temperature at higher elevation, right? What happens if you take hot water that's deep in the earth and you begin to raise it? What happens to the boiling point? What happens to its relationship with boiling? At some point, that pressure drops to where it will begin to boil, right? So at some point down here, and it's not sure exactly where it is, this water will boil. Okay, now, let's say you've got a gas in there like CO2. Well, on the other hand, let's say you've got a salt in there just for the heck of it, let's say table salt. Um, do you think the CO2 will go with the steam? Do you think the table salt will go with the steam? Ah, good point. Some things are not volatile. When the water boils, in fact, what's a great way to make distilled water? You boil water, right? And the salts stay behind. In fact, you know, if you use a pot for boiling a lot of water, after a while you get this crust and stuff in the pot because all those things that are not volatile will stay behind in the pot. So a very important thing that happens to the chemistry of this water when it boils and you get these sort of steam convection cells here uh, is that the things that are non-soluble will stay down here and the things that are volatile will go up here. Well somebody already said it, but, but CO2 is one example of something that will go along with all that water. I should use a different color here. Uh, but another thing is you, somebody I think also mentioned is other sulfur, other volcanic gases like sulfur 
hydrogen sulfide uh, will go up with this water. Now, this stuff up here now, the water begins to condense in some cases. So again, you have water up in here. And now it's condensed and it's got hydrogen sulfide, CO2, and water, but it's still hot. So what do you think will happen with that water with the rock? It'll, re it'll react quickly. Yeah, just like hot water anyplace else, that water, it's still hot and it will begin to react with the rock. But now we have another interesting thing. Water coming down from the surface has oxygen in it. Okay, oxygenated water, that runoff that we talked about. That water will begin to encounter this water and what will happen when that oxygen hits these hydrogen sulfide? Chemical reaction. Sulfate. They create sulfate. sulfate. Yeah, so it'll, we need some other people to make answers. He's answering, <laughs> getting all the right answers over here. <laughs> that oxygen reacts with that to form what? Sulfate, but what's, what's sulfuric significant? Acid. Acid. Sulfuric acid. Yeah, sulfuric okay. acid. Okay, so now, unlike down here where you just had hot water reacting with the rock and, or dissolving the rock, now you've got a very strong acid, okay? And that strong acid now begins to interact with the rock, and what do you think that'll do to the rate at which it's dissolving and, and altering the rock? Well, it'll increase it quite dramatically. And so where oxygen can get into that groundwater, uh, it'll really cause an, an interaction, and in this place, uh, the hypothesis is, well, that might be an interesting example of a place called Devil's Kitchen, okay? And so, to understand the water that we're going to see at these different field sites, we want to do an experiment in the laboratory that basically simulates what we think is a very relevant process happening in the field to see if our experiment can replicate what uh, we're observing in terms of the water samples that we're taking in, in the field. And of course, from that, make the step to understanding the kinds of organisms that could live in that environment. So part of trying to understand how this environment at Devil's Kitchen is formed we want to simulate a very important process. We want to take hot water and we want to take sulfuric acid because you know the evidence is that that's what's being formed down here. And we want it to interact with this rock right here in order to see if that can explain the environment that we see at the surface. Now the interesting thing over here is that we have, uh, let's say the water continues to go along and maybe it's, it doesn't go right through here. It's coming down and it also encounters another place. But in this case, when the water boils or whatever, uh, maybe it can get to the surface uh, without having the oxygen. In other words, there's no oxygen here. There's no oxygen here, and this water can just get to the surface. In which case, maybe it's not so strongly acid, or maybe uh, there, it had some oxygen down here, and it, it reacted so much that all of the oxygen got consumed, and then the water came to the surface. And perhaps that might explain uh, what we see at our, at our other hot spring site, which is the, uh, the alkaline uh, hot spring, okay? Or maybe the temperature was lower, maybe something was different. And in any case, we're seeing a different type of, uh, different type of result. Instead of getting acid here like we see at Devil's Kitchen, something different is happening here that makes it alkaline. And so let's just assume that we still have the same thing. In fact, I shouldn't have crossed out the oxygen here. Let's assume that we still had this, this shallow water that was oxygenated. But for some reason, something is different here. And so we want to just see maybe what other things might be causing this to, to happen. Uh, and of course, maybe it's the difference in the rock in this, in this environment. Uh, we don't know. That'll be part of our experiment. And then in the case of the neutral group, uh, maybe there's just a surface water interacting with these rocks uh, would help us understand what we're seeing at the neutral site. Maybe the surface water that never got down here has interacted with the rocks at the surface to create the kinds of chemistry that we're going to see in the water at the, uh, at the neutral site. So this is the idea. We're going to, we think there are these processes happening within, in, in, the, in the basement, basically underneath Warner Valley, where you have this water that's coming up, it's condensed, the steam is condensing, interacting with the oxygen, interacting with the rocks to create the different types of chemistries that we see in these different places. So now, now I'm going to ask the alkaline group if you can come up and find your site on this map. Okay, here's where we camped down here in the Warner Valley campground. Here's the valley. We hiked up during our trip all the way up the valley. Is, and somebody in the alkaline group want to come up and see if they can find on the map where your hot spring site was. Yeah. 
Cheated. <laughs> Here, I'm glad you started with you guys because you didn't make a red photographic map before. All right. So where do you think? All right. That's very good. Okay. Now, as your reward, this is an overlay, and uh, this, see this number six thousand. See that? So can you lay that on that map and, and look to register it right on the map where it goes? This is a piece of road, and this is the number six thousand. Thank you. Okay, so the Alpine group has located, has, has located their site, and you know, the question is, what's this that we just taped up here? This line here, this green area, represents what we call the salt rock. You're done. Thank you. This is, so this hell site, as it turns out, if you look at this incredibly complicated map over here, and I showed a piece of it during my lecture, where I showed you all these different colors, and I said all these different colors are different lava flows. This green area down here happens to be what we call basalt. It's the same kind of rock that you can see at, at Cindercombe. See, these are all the different types of rocks that are in Alaskan Volcanic Park. But this is what basalt looks like. And if we get to go to Cindercombe later on, you'll actually get to see how this looks when it comes out, what it looks like when it comes out of the ground. This is the rock type that's represented down here on the south side of Lassen. And so the acid, the alkaline groups experiment, these guys here, they're going to do their acid experiment with this rock, okay, to see if that interaction can explain what you guys are seeing at your spring, okay, so you're going to do that lab experiment with this type of a rock. Okay, now I need just to go to the other extreme, the acid group to come up, and my gosh, I've got to figure out which piece is which. Challenge. This is the acid one here. First of all, locate your field site and then locate okay, somebody, some brave to volunteer to come up with the acid. Locate where you are and then register this on the back. Alright, very good. Alright, now, okay, Sandy, you got some marks on here to help them locate? Yes, I did. Uh, you need to overlay that. Did you put marks on here, Sandy, to help them locate? I did. Ah, she said she did. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's a And I'm thinking we're right in the middle. No, I'm not. Just saying. That's a 6 degrees. That's a 6 degrees. Oh, okay. Is there another key in here? Oh, yeah. There is. There's two on each one. Okay, so now let's go back to the field. Here's 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 the field. Uh, called, this is called dacite and andesite. These are two other types of volcanic rocks in Lassen Park. And they are represented by actually these three pieces here. That's the andesite. You don't have much of that left because we ground it up for your experiment. These, <laughs> these two are, that's the trouble with this. We got a little too enthusiastic. This is the kind of andesite, dacite that's near the site here. So your experiment, the acid group, is to see what happens when you take your warm hot sulfuric acid solution and react it with these rock types to see if that can explain the chemistry that you see at your site. And now, last but not least, the neutral site. You guys have to come up. Somebody need a crowd representative to come up here Brandon. and locate your site. And now if you can read maps, you can just get a sense of how you guys might. So your height, these are the trails. You were there. Okay. And here's the stream. So you remember the one point across the stream, right? And then, of course, you guys also said we were on the trail. OK, I'm sorry. I'm just too rough. It's actually here. And um, 
you actually, you guys in concert with the other two groups are going to do what we call a pH experiment. These guys in both cases are using acid with their rocks uh, to do the experiment, but of course being neutral, you're going to use a more neutral pH to interact with, with your uh, uh, samples, and so you get to do an experiment both with a day site and with a salt. So we can then, you, when your results, you'll be able to compare with the others to see what the effect of the pH has been on, on your sample. And so with that, that's basically it. Uh, the, the dissolution experiment is basically taking a concentrated sulfuric acid solution, interacting with two different rocks at different temperatures to try to simulate what's happening in the field and therefore maybe help to explain the kinds of analysis you know, the results you're going to get from your water samples. And then from that, to try to understand why these why the organisms that you see are living in those places. With that, I hand it over to Mike. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Uh, very well. <laughs> okay, so um, as Dave just said, uh, we're going to be using um, acid and rocks for the acid and alkaline group to essentially re recreate in the lab what we're seeing in the field. Okay, the idea is we want to sort of verify in the lab that what we're seeing in the field is actually what we think is going on, which is hot acid interacting with specific rock types native to your field site, okay? And again, for the neutral group, you'll be using, um, you'll be using neutral water to try to affect these rocks in the same way, okay? So if you take a look at this, um, this is the protocol, the lab outline that I just handed out. So the overview is basically kind of a summary of what Dave was just talking about. I, I tried to summarize that in, in a couple paragraphs there. Um, and then the synopsis is basically the, the bottom line of this experiment, okay? So very quickly, um, so we're a little limited on time today. So first I want to start by asking, it's already 2.10. I want to ask who needs to leave at 3? You need to leave at 3, Sarah, okay. Can anybody stay a little later than 3? Till like, let's say 3.15 maybe? Would that be okay? Okay, okay, cool. So everybody but Sarah, okay, cool. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you basically, I'm gonna give like a five to 10 minute, very quick outline on the board about what you're gonna do in the lab. All of this is written up in the next set of pages, okay? There's the material section, you can just ignore that for now. But for the acid, for the acid group, your day one experiment um, instructions are here, and this is what I'm gonna be going over very quickly in the morning, okay? Um, for the alkaline group, your, set of, your instructions are on page five, or the six or whatever that is. And then for the neutral group, your instructions are then um, two more pages behind that, okay? I'm, gonna, um, I'm basically gonna talk about what the acid group is gonna do, just so everybody sort of has an idea. Um, very quickly, just so we can uh, talk about this. We're gonna stop the lab at 10 till three, so that you guys can uh, fill out Sandy's, the rest of Sandy's questionnaires. Um, so even if we're not completely done setting up the lab by 10 to 3, we're going to stop, do those surveys, and then Sarah, if you need to leave at 3, and you'll leave, and the rest of us can just finish up. You're in the alkaline group, so we should be done. It's just the neutral group that may take a little longer because you basically have twice as much time. <laughs> so very quickly, um, if you guys can just turn, let's all turn to the, um, the acid group page. Um, so I don't know why you erase that, but it's, well, I'm going to have to. Sorry, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, so basically what we're going to do is we are taking a container, a plastic container, okay, and we are going to, uh, for the, so this is going to be the acid group, okay, I'll put the alkaline here, and this is going to be the neutral group. Can everybody see that? My, Okay. Okay. So the acid group is going to take their container, and we put. I've already done the first couple lines for you guys. The setup now. We're going to put 500 mils of sulfuric acid. H2. H2. It's so natural to write H2O. H2SO4. Um, and then we're going to put um, in the bottom of this. We're going to put six grams of anisite. Okay. And why anisite alkaline group? Exactly. Oh wait, it's acid. I thought you were talking about alkaline. No, we were using the salt. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yes. is using anisite because anisite is a dominant, one of the dominant rock types in the Okay. So for the alkaline group, we're going to take our containers and we're going to put in 500 mils of H2SO4, which I've, gosh, ah, 
H2O. H2O. Yes, H2O. Yeah. <laughs> That's something different. Okay. Actually more, right? And we're going to put in six grams of basalt because. That's the dominant rock group right there. Exactly. Okay. Wow. And now the neutral group. Uh, oh, and this is pH3. Anybody want to guess why we're doing pH3? Because the hydrothermal features are acidic. Exactly. And the reason we're not doing the pH2 is because. For liability oh, yeah. reasons. <laughs> Look at it this way. This is about the pH of club soda. Have you ever gotten club soda in your eye? That yeah, kind of hurts a little bit. pH2 is the acidity of blue. Lemon juice. Ugh. Lemon juice hurts, so it's more of a pH3. More of a practical thing. <laughs> and then for the neutral group, I mean, yeah, it'd be great to be one, but that gets a little cold. Um, so for the neutral group, we're going to be 500 mils of water. There we go. H2O. I think that will write it. And we're going to put in six grams. They're going to do six grams of basalt. Okay, and they're going to do a second container with 500 mils of water. And six grams of andesite. Okay. The idea being, if I could write it, the idea being that between the neutral group and the acid group, this is a pH experiment, and between the neutral group and the alkaline group, this is a pH experiment. Okay. In other words, you're basically doing you're doing the the, the non-acidic control. Okay. The neutral group will also be taking the true controls, or, you know, the negative controls. Okay. This is going to be H2SO4. Ugh. H2SO4 <laughs> with no, no andesite or basalt. No rock, right? No rock. No rock. Okay? In other words, let's just make sure that this H2SO4 doesn't magically do something on its own. So we're just gonna we're just gonna take one and set it there, okay? And then we're gonna have um this is gonna be 500 mils of just H2O, okay, with no rock. No rock. So this is the control for your experiment, and this is the control for the other experiments. Okay? So you guys have to be particular. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm going to point something out here. We're going to be measuring the pH and conductivity just like we do um, in the field, as well as taking the water samples just like we do in the field. The catch here is that these are all distilled water, right? The conductivity should be like next to nothing, okay? But the sulfuric acid is, I mean, it's, this is a, a 10 millimolar. Sulfuric acid. In other words, it's actually pretty concentrated compared to these. Mm -hmm. So when you make a measurement here and you go to here, you really need to make sure to rinse your probes extremely well, because even a small amount of contamination is going to show up. Maybe you want to do your ones. acid at the very end. Exactly. That's a, a great idea. Do the acid at the end. Measure your acid last. Okay. Now, just to, so that we don't pick on the neutral group too much with four sets of bottles, and everybody only has one. And we want, in science, it's a really important thing to be able to replicate your results or replicate your experiment because we all have bad days. Sometimes something goofy goes on, right? And it's nice to know that if you do this, do this experiment twice or three times or four times, that you will get more or less the same result. So for the sake of scientific rigor, each group, or the acid and alkaline group, are going to have a second replicate. It's going to be the exact same thing. You're going to do the exact same things to both. But you're going to have a second container just to make sure that we don't end up with flukes. Okay. Um, okay. This is what we're going to do today. We're going to set these all up, get it all going. We're going to put our um, we're going to put our rock in the container. We're going to stir them up. We have stir bars. We're going to put in there. Okay. We're going to stir them up. We're going to um, measure the pH and conductivity. Okay. Before we put the rock in. Important point. And then also measure it immediately after. So what I've said in here is put the rock in, let it stir for five minutes, turn the stir bar off, let it sit for five minutes, and then measure the pH and conductivity again. It doesn't really have to be five minutes, but just like stir it up for a minute or two, make sure it's well mixed. Turn it off, make sure you get a little bit of settling so you're not pulling in a ton of rock powder in your syringe. And then, um, and, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, just uh, turn it off for a few minutes, let it settle for a few minutes, and then measure the pH and conductivity, and then we'll take water samples. Um, so let's see, where was I going with this format? Um, that's about it for today. So, so you'll take pH conductivity before, pH conductivity after, okay? And then at the very end, you're going to take your water samples, the cation and the anion samples, okay? We want 60 mils for the cation samples and 40 mils for the anion samples. We typically do 60, but this leaves us with a nice round number of 400 mils at the end. Of today. So that's why we're going with that. And we'll be showing them how to adjust 
Yeah, I'll go to that in just one second. Question? We need to filter the analogs. We do, we do, we do. Um, neutral group, I recommend doing doing your these two water samples first. Then we have no rock in it, so it'll go really fast. Um, and that's also why I said let it settle for a little bit before you take your sample for filtering. Because if you have you know, less rock stuff you have in there, the faster it'll filter. Okay? Um, then, during the course of the experiment, basically, in, over the next week, you guys need to come in and measure the temperature of your experiment. We, we want to get these to a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. Okay? We found out last year that was actually kind of tough to do. So um, we need you to come in as much as possible. If it's once a day, that's great. And basically, just take the temperature. You can just use the conductivity probe. And all you have to do is stick the little, the little end of it in there. It gives you good temperature readings really quick. And just gradually increase the temperature of your um, hot plate until you, you measure a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. Okay. Once you do that, okay, that's the, sort of the second part of the experiment. Once you do that, then every week after, you get to 60 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, basically in, in a week and a half to two weeks from now. Okay, we want you guys to start coming in weekly, maybe once every two weeks, once every 10 days, whatever works in your schedule, but has to be at least every two weeks, okay? And we want you guys to then measure the pH and conductivity of these solutions, okay? And we want you to record what that new pH and conductivity are, okay? And if the pH has gone up by more than, let's say, 0.2 pH units, which is what I put in here, then we want you to basically keep acidifying it to keep it at a pH of three. Okay, so we have some um, acid back there. It's one molar, one molar, strong acid. Okay, so be careful. And we're basically going to have you like drip the acid in there. We'll show you how to do this later. It's a specific procedure, but basically you're going to drop acid in here until you get to a pH of three, and then you're going to record. <laughs> and then you're going to record how much acid you added. Okay. Um, Anyway, okay, so I'm hurrying to wrap that up on time. Um, anyway, so we'll show you how to do this. This is called the titration. Okay, we'll show you how to do that titration um, while we're in the lab. Um, any questions? No, I meant to miss it. Okay, let's go ahead and do this. Oh, the other thing too, guys, when you're throughout this entire lab, always, always, always wear eyewear. If you wear glasses, that's fine. We also have. Um, uh, safety glasses for those who don't, okay? <coughs> and always wear gloves, please, when you're doing any kind of measuring or titrating. So let's go ahead and break up into our groups, get back there. Um, oh.